Good morning, everybody. My name is Carl Pafford. For those who don't know me, I serve on the leadership team of elders here, and it's my privilege to do so. We're entering a time of worship through giving and communion, and as usual, thank you for the faithful giving. I mean, we look around the building. Yes, we have carpet. Yes, we have other things, but really the ability to give to the missions that we support, the ability through benevolence and other things that we're called to do biblically is accomplished through your, y'all's giving. It's not because we magically have this pot of money that shows up. So thank you for that. And we do take the money that is given very seriously, with admin team and elders, and making sure that it is used for God's work and not just for us. I think some of you know this, but, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, I tried to put in there elders retreat to uh, Grand Cayman, and they said no. So just be, know that we do not take the money and use it the wrong way. So we, time of communion, just the mechanics of it. If you're a member here or a regular, please feel free to give. If you're a guest, don't feel obligated at all, but if led, please do. Put it in the black boxes, and then communion is in these little cups up here. Please come up here, take it, take it back to your seat, take it as you feel led to take it, and then at the end of the service, please deposit it in the trash bins out of either door. Equality. If you're watching the Olympics, which I have been, I admit it, I do that, you see that France stuck in their little opening ceremonies, liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, fraternity. But if we're honest with ourselves, there is nothing equal about the Olympics. Structurally, if you look at Moldova, their judo team versus America's judo team that trains out there, Colorado Springs, the dietetics that's involved, everything that's there, it's not equal. Um, but in the opening ceremony, talk about how equal it is that athletes from everywhere get to come and compete. Well, there are certain advantages. Um, also, genetically, it is not equal. If you look at Caleb Dressel, even though he's the shortest person on the men's swim team that won the 4x100 relay, he's got shoulders this wide, arms that go past his knees, cardiac that's unbelievable. You look at Noah Lyles, he has fast twitch muscles that you wouldn't believe. I would love to be a middle blocker on the men's volleyball team. There is no amount of work that I can put in that is going to put me there. It is unequal. It is. There's nothing equal about it. I can work, and I don't want to belittle their work. The people that get to the Olympics, no matter where you come from, have worked their entire lives to get there. There's a lot of work. I can't work myself to six foot six with a you know, 30-inch vertical. Anybody that's seen me out there on the volleyball court has seen my four-inch vertical on a good day. Uh, doesn't even clear the net. So, there is not equality in the French Olympics. However, I do have equality with every one of those Olympic athletes, and so do you. And that equality is, is that before God, we are all equal. As it says in Romans, starting in 22 and 23, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody, whether you're Caleb Dressel, Dressler, if you're the I watched fencing yesterday just because it's fascinating to me. I am equal to all of them. And with that, if you're Alex Graham, um, he was on a podcast recently, does Loaves and Fishes Ministry in Texas. Or you're Jeffrey Dahmer, who reportedly gave his life to Christ just a couple days before he was killed in prison as a mass serial killer. To God, we're all the same no matter what we do. At the communion table, we're called to remember that we are sinners before God, but God provided the means to bring us in his presence. If you've accepted the Holy Spirit in your heart, you have become a Christian. As it says in Romans 23 and 24, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Every Sunday, at this church and across the world. It doesn't matter what denomination. It doesn't matter if you're in a home church in secret in China, if you're here in Fishers, if you're in Rome, if you're in the Asian Pacific. Celebrating communion, we share that equally with other Christians. And again, it's not through our hard work, but as it says in Romans, received by faith through the Holy Spirit. So as we celebrate communion here today, and you come up, you take these elements, the symbol of the blood that was shed and the body that was broken, I urge you to think about how we are equal to everybody. We are sinners, good life or not, um, but God loved us so much that 
when his son celebrated Passover and then died on the cross, and we celebrate that in remembrance today, we have an end game with God where we will be there together. Would you pray with me? Father God, you are truly an awesome God, and we are all equal before you. It doesn't matter what we do, where we came from, where we live, or who we are. We know that we are all sinners. But thank you for your son who died willingly for us so that we may have an eternity with you and that we have an eternity with others, Lord, and know that we are equal in your eyes. Lord, we pray that as we take these elements, our heart will be right with you, that we set aside what's there, and just remember, you loved us enough to do this. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning again. Thanks for joining us here at Prairie View Christian Church. When a person first becomes a Christian, they often enter what's affectionately referred to by some as the cage stage, and that means that they should be kept in a cage for a while. Because this new convert will read everything about the faith that they can get their hands on, even if it's not all helpful. They will talk about Jesus constantly, perhaps to the point of being obnoxious. And last but not least, 
They love to start fights with non-believers. Or a more charitable way of describing it might be they love to initiate spirited debates. But in those debates, there's one argument that tends to trip up this well-meaning, passionate, but immature follower of Jesus. And that argument usually goes something like this. If you Christians supposedly take the Bible so seriously, then why don't you follow all of the laws in the Old Testament? Why don't Christians avoid pork? Why don't we confirm that every baby boy is circumcised on the eighth day? And why don't we strictly observe Sabbath regulations? This new believer may not have a great response. But Acts chapters 10, 11, and 15 can go a long way in helping us answer that question. We don't have to do those things because we aren't Jewish. We don't have to do those things because we are followers of Jesus. And faith in Jesus, apart from works of the law, is enough to grant us entrance into the people of God. However, that wasn't always the case. And the chapters that we'll focus on this morning tell us how this astonishing change actually took place. So open up to Acts chapter 10, verse 1. Feel free to use one of the Bibles here if you didn't bring one, and take it home if you don't have one. But let's begin with prayer. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, thank you that we can come to you by faith. We don't get to call upon your name in prayer because we've jumped through hoops, because we've proven ourselves, or because we are inherently worthy of your attention, that we are worthy of a hearing with you. None of those things is true. We come to you by faith, we come to you by virtue of the person and work of Christ, not any works of our own. We bring nothing to the table, and yet you graciously welcome us into your presence in prayer. And even greater than that, you graciously welcome us into your family by faith in Christ. Lord, thank you for this good news that we'll get to read about this morning, this good news that we so often take for granted, having not lived in the days of the book of Acts. But Lord, help us truly appreciate how awesome of a privilege it is to come into your presence, to be able to call you our Father, our Lord, and our King simply by faith in who Christ is and what Christ has done. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these people. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word that we get to read and study and preach today. We love you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, for the first five or six chapters of Acts, it seems like the Apostle Peter was the straw that stirred the drink of the early church. He leads the charge to replace Judas. He preaches boldly. He performs miracles. He confronts the religious leaders. He deals with scandal. It seems to all revolve around Peter. But to be honest, we haven't talked about Peter much the past few weeks. Chapter 7 focused on Stephen. Chapter 8 revolved more around Philip. And chapter 9 primarily concerned Saul. It turns out that as important as he is, Peter is not the main driver of the early church. God is, namely the Holy Spirit. And Peter will fade from the story as we press on in Acts. But before we leave him behind, Peter plays a major role in what we read today. So, starting in chapter 10, verse 1. It's a long scripture reading, longest one of the morning, but it's important. So we're going to read all of it, almost all of it. Chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. He's a great guy. Too bad he's a Gentile. Verse 3. 
About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheep descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, again, too bad he's a Gentile, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests, And the next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. In the following verses, Peter ends up at Cornelius' house. There's a large group of Gentiles gathered, and we pick up in verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. From their very beginning, Jews had defined themselves over and against the Gentiles, a.k.a. everyone who wasn't Jewish. As Abraham's promised descendants, the Jews were graciously chosen by God. 
They were called into an exclusive covenant relationship with God. They specifically received their law from God's very hand. Gentiles couldn't claim any of that. But on top of all of that, the Jews' enemies, of which they had many, were all Gentiles. The Egyptians who enslaved them, the Canaanites who opposed them, the Assyrians who exiled them, the Babylonians who devastated them, and the Romans who dominated them all had one thing in common, and it's that they were all Gentiles. The Jews were different from everybody else in the world. They were in a class of their own. And the biggest practices that made that difference visible were number one, physical circumcision of males, and number two, food laws. Those practices were put in place by God himself to set the Jews apart from the surrounding nations. Those practices testify to the Jews' unique identity as God's people, unlike anybody else. Now then, could a Gentile be admitted into the people of God? Well, they absolutely could. But there was a catch. They had to become Jews. Ethnic non-Jews who converted to the Jewish faith were known as proselytes, a word that's come up a couple of times in the book of Acts so far. But how does a Gentile become a Jew? Great question. Well, you can't change your family tree, but you can change your diet. And no, you can't make yourself a physical descendant of Abraham's body, but you can make your physical body, or your husband's, or your son's, look a little more like his body. And if a Gentile was willing to do those things, to observe the practice of circumcision and submit to the restrictions about food, then you would be welcomed into the family with open arms. But if you didn't, well, you'd still be on the outside looking in. You'd still be a Gentile. That is until we get to Acts chapter 10. God tells Peter in the vision we just read about that no person made in God's image is off limits to hearing the gospel. There's no amusement park style, you must be this Jewish to ride sign. And God backs up that vision by giving his Holy Spirit to anyone who believes in Jesus, even Gentiles. Acts 10 is not celebrating the fact that Peter can now enjoy a BLT. Although that's nice. The diet is irrelevant so long as a person believes in Jesus. Physical circumcision is a non-issue so long as a person believes in Jesus. Faith in Jesus Christ believing that he is God's son, believing that he died on the cross for our sins, believing that he rose from the dead to prove that he is Savior and Lord is enough for our salvation. If a person believes in Jesus, they belong to God. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You know, Peter would have never come to that conclusion on his own. This was a shocking revelation to his fellow Jews. But in a sense, maybe it shouldn't have been. After all, there are hints of this in the Old Testament. In Genesis 3, God promises to redeem sinful humanity, not just one people group through one of Eve's offspring. Then in Genesis 12, God's promise to Abraham is said to bless all the families of the earth, not just Abraham's family. In Deuteronomy 4, God makes it clear that the Israelites were supposed to be different from the surrounding world, but it wasn't to spite everybody else. It wasn't so that they could thumb their noses at everybody else, but it was so that everybody else's interest might be sparked. 
In Psalm 98, God reveals his righteousness not just to Israel, but to the nations. And in chapter 49, verse 6, the prophet Isaiah looks forward to a day when God's salvation will reach to the end of the earth, which ought to sound familiar if you've been here for all of the Acts sermons. But there are also hints of this breakthrough in Jesus' ministry. In Matthew 8, Jesus marvels at the faith of another Gentile centurion and says that he has not seen such faith in Israel. In Mark 5, Jesus intentionally goes to a predominantly Gentile region, one that had pigs all over the place, and heals a demon-possessed man. In Luke 23, yet another Gentile centurion recognizes Jesus' innocence as he hangs on the cross, ironically, while Jewish religious leaders mock him. And in John 12, after a group of Greeks come to Jesus, he says that when he is lifted up on the cross, he will draw all men to himself, not just Israelites. And finally, we've seen this coming in the book of Acts. Jesus' stated mission in chapter 1, verse 8, the summary of the whole book is that his disciples would be his witnesses to the end of the earth. We've seen Philip preach to Samaritans, an Ethiopian get baptized, and Saul announced as God's chosen instrument to carry his name before the Gentiles. This might seem like an obvious progression to us. After all, we Christians have the benefit of hindsight, and we Gentiles may be a bit biased. But it was revolutionary to first century Jews, and it didn't come without pushback. As we continue the story, the apostles back in Jerusalem hear that Peter has entered a Gentile's house, which you're not supposed to do, preached the gospel to them, which was kind of unheard of, and baptize them, which is very unheard of. And a group called the Circumcision Party, which, by the way, needs better PR than calling themselves the Circumcision Party, demands an explanation from Peter. And most of chapter 11 is Peter recounting that experience, everything we just read about in chapter 10. And thankfully, the apostles recognize what God is doing, and they get on board. We read their conclusion in chapter 11, verse 18. When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. A church is formed in Antioch as a result of all of this. And it also seems like a good time to fetch that zealous young man from Tarsus we read about last week. That persecutor turned Christian who has a very particular set of skills that makes him a nightmare for those who seek to keep Gentiles at arm's length. It turns out that everyone is welcome among God's people, and all that's required is faith in Jesus. It's a done deal. Case closed, right? Not exactly. Jump ahead to chapter 15, starting in verse 1. We'll read chapters 13 and 14 next week. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. There's that circumcision party again, causing trouble. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So Paul and Barnabas go. They make their argument for Gentiles being welcomed in the family of God by faith alone. Peter reminds everyone of what happened in chapters 10 and 11. And we see the apostolic response in verse 13. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. 
just as it is written, after this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. Those all come back to idolatry, worshiping false gods. Verse 21, for from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So even after what happened in chapters 10 and 11, the issue wasn't settled. Judaizers, the circumcision party, people who think that faith in Jesus is great, but that you still need to submit to the law of Moses to be saved, well, they're not so easily convinced. And that counsel in Acts 15 is the official affirmation that faith in Jesus is enough. It's so important that some call it the center of the book of Acts. But even after that counsel, the circumcision party didn't go away quietly. They caused problems throughout decades following Acts 15. And a lot of Paul's writing in the rest of the New Testament is dedicated to rebuking these people's error. But thankfully, truth won out in the end. God's people are not comprised of just ethnic Jews or just practicing Jews. We're made up of all who believe in Jesus. We're not comprised of people who prove themselves worthy of entrance into God's family by doing all the right things all the time, by following all the right rules all the time. Instead, we are made up of sinners who turn in faith to the only perfectly righteous man who ever lived. And that is Jesus Christ. Now, you may hear all this talk of Jews and Gentiles, food laws and circumcisions, Judaizers and councils, and conclude that this doesn't have any ramifications for us. But you would be very wrong. Because when many of us hear the gospel for the first time, deep down we think to ourselves, you know, that sounds wonderful, but is faith in Jesus really enough to save me? My guilt is too paralyzing. My doubt is too deep. My regrets are too many. My shame is too strong. And my sins are too severe. I've got way too many skeletons in my closet to be saved by anything, especially something as easy as faith. It sounds too good to be true. But if you believe in Jesus, you are saved. Now, that does not mean that we can be spiritually lazy as long as our hearts are in the right place. But it does mean that faith in Jesus Christ is enough to overcome your insecurities. And it's enough to overcome your history. But we may also hear all this pleasant talk of salvation by faith alone and not by works of the law and think to ourselves deep down, You know, that sounds wonderful, but is faith in Jesus really enough to save them? That person over there doesn't look like me, doesn't sound like me, doesn't act like me, doesn't vote like me, and doesn't think like me. They've got way too many skeletons in their closet to be saved by anything, especially something as easy as faith. That sounds too good to be true. But if that person over there believes in Jesus, guess what? They're saved too. That doesn't mean that there won't be real disagreements between fellow believers who need to be dealt with. It doesn't mean that a believer who's rebellious, misguided, or willfully ignorant doesn't need correction. 
but it does mean that we should be incredibly careful about questioning the salvation of someone who confesses Jesus as Lord. And finally, we may hear all this talk of salvation by faith alone and ask ourselves, well, then what about the law of Moses? What about the Old Testament? The law had a good place and a good purpose for God's people then, the people of Israel. And it still has a good place and a good purpose for God's people now, believers in Jesus. The law was never the true foundation of a person's relationship with God. That's always been God's grace. And obeying the law was never the ultimate expression of one's relationship with God faith was. Paul talks about this with Abraham in Romans chapter 4. But none of that changes the fact that even now, the law can help us understand God's character. It can teach us how to imitate God in a world that doesn't know him, and it can identify sin. So we don't want to be legalists who question whether faith in Jesus is enough and add more bars that people have to clear if they want to truly be saved. But we also don't want to be antinomians, people who suggest that as long as you believe in Jesus in your head or have some fuzzy feelings about him in your heart, then it doesn't really matter what you do with the rest of you. We want to avoid both of those errors. We're not saved by God's law. We're saved by God's Son. But people who are saved by God's Son, people who are indwelt by God's Spirit, should end up looking like righteous, law-abiding people in all kinds of ways. Now back to our original question, the one that has stumped many a new believer in the wild west of the internet message board. Why don't we Christians follow all the laws of the Old Testament? Why don't we avoid pork? Why don't we confirm that every baby boy is circumcised on the eighth day? Why don't we strictly observe Sabbath regulations? Because we don't have to. Because faith in Jesus is enough. We don't have to jump through those hoops to get into God's family. We don't have to prove ourselves worthy to stay in God's family. God has graciously given us everything we need for our salvation in the person and work of his son. And that is good news for all who believe in Jesus, Jew and Gentile alike. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that faith in Christ is enough for us. We are not always going to be righteous. We are not always going to do the right thing or say the right thing or think the right thing or feel the right thing. But even when those times of doubt or fear or insecurity or sin or unfaithfulness come, we trust in the person and work of Christ. We're not always going to be in a good place spiritually. We're not always going to be in a good place mentally or emotionally or physically. We're not always going to be in this thriving state of spiritual growth. But Lord, thank you that we don't have to always be in the right place. We don't have to always do the right thing. Our salvation is not dependent upon our performance. It's dependent upon Christ being in the right place. It's upon Christ performing what we could never perform, and that is true and perfect righteousness. Thank you that Christ is always in the right place to save us. He's not in the tomb. He's at your right hand. Thank you, Lord, for interceding for us. Thank you for securing our salvation for us, which is something we could not secure on our own. No matter how many tears or how much blood or how much sweat we shed, We could not earn our salvation. 
we could not prove ourselves worthy. And so, Lord, thank you that you did what we could not. And that by faith in you, our sins are forgiven. By faith in you, we share in your victory over sin, over death, over Satan, over worldly powers and authorities. And thank you that none of that stuff, who you are and what you've done, none of that wavers. As much as we might waver, as much as we might not feel it all the time, as much as we can wander and stray, thank you that you remain the same and that our salvation is secure, not in us, but in you. We love you, we praise you, we thank you, we glorify you for all of this. We ask this all in Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Lost our seed, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every
That concludes our service. If you have questions about what it means to be a follower of Christ, uh, what it means to be a member of our church, we would love to have those conversations with you. Or if you just have something to pray about, we'd be happy to pray with you as well. Uh, so find an elder, find a pastor, find someone with a name tag, hang out in the lobby and catch up with people, get to know people. Uh, and of course, we hope to see you in the week ahead. So with that, I'll close our service in prayer. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time we've had together. And even as we leave this place and go our separate ways, help us glorify you. And Lord, I pray that you'd remind all of us that in Christ alone, our hope is found, as we sang earlier. Uh, remind us of that when we're puffed up with our own supposed goodness uh, and arrogantly thinking that we're pretty great, that we're pretty worthy of the gifts that you've given us. Lord, I pray that you would humble us in that situation and remind us that in Christ alone, our hope is found. And if we're just racked by guilt and despair and discouragement and thinking that you could not possibly save people like us, remind us in that scenario as well that in Christ alone, our hope is found. Uh, in that sense, as we said earlier, we are all equal before you. We are all in need of the Lord Jesus. And thank you that you've provided Christ for us. Thank you that we can be your children, your servants, your saints, by faith in Christ and faith in Christ alone. Help us carry his name before the Gentiles and before the Jews that we meet in the week ahead of us, wherever we go and whatever we do. We love you. We glorify you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. I forgot to say it last week, so go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here.